fun. You want me to just introduce myself and tell the story? Yeah. That's what I'll do. Okay. You guys ready? Yeah. Hello, I'm Trey Shannon from Portland, Oregon, and uh, I'm a co-owner of Voodoo Donut. And uh, I have kind of an interesting story to tell about uh, the night of the premiere of uh, my own private Idaho, which was uh, held at the Clinton Street Theater. And I don't remember the date exactly, but it was uh, during the summer, I believe. And uh, Scott Green was a friend of mine. The Kurtz Project played the rap party as well at some point with the Tutu Band. And uh, Scott Green and I were buddies, and I've known Gus kind of on and off, you know, casually for a while, and liked his band Destroy All Blondes back in the late 80s. And uh, he uh, got, it was a big to do. All of Portland was invited. It was Gus Van Sant's new big movie he'd been working on. But he showed an earlier screening at like six o'clock for uh, the cast and crew, and I got invited to that. And so after the movie, Scott Green uh, invited, we had this, he had been promising for about two years to give me a radio transmitter. And uh, I kept thinking a radio transmitter was this huge thing I would need a truck for or something. But he assured me uh, after the screening that we could go get it right then and there because we had just seen the movie and we needed to kind of blow out of there. So we uh, drove to Gus's house where Scott had been staying. And I guess a lot of the you know, principals in the movie had been staying at Gus's pad there. And he had just bought this house up in the hills. And uh, so we ended up going to Gus Van Zandt's house, which uh, was kind of interesting because every single person in Portland was at the Clinton Street Theater, including Gus Van Zandt, and no one was watching his house. So now that Gus is a big wig, if he ever does these screenings again in Portland, he should always put somebody on, to, you know, on the door there to guard his house. Because uh, Scott Green let us into his house, and of course I was very respectful. I liked Mr. Van Zant and all, and I wouldn't have touched anything at all. But while we were looking at the radio transmitter, which happened to only like fit in a shoebox or something, thank you, in a little shoebox deal, um, <laughs> my uh, partner Benjamin from the X-Ray, uh, he and Scott were discussing the radio transmitter, which then allowed me to sort of walk around and bothered and, and uh, just kind of wander around Gus's new beautiful house, which was kind of sparsely furnitured, but he was working and uh, lots of proofs of uh, William Burroughs on the kitchen table and lots of actual, you know, photos of William Burroughs. And he'd been working, I think, with William and Kurt Cobain and all of those. And I, you know, I don't know what Gus was doing at those times, but all sorts of stuff. And, uh, and so while I'm sitting there looking at all these pictures of William Burroughs, which are pretty fascinating, I noticed that his address book was sitting there, and uh, I feel really bad about this, Gus, but uh, I kind of like, and I really did do this. I didn't even thumb through it. I actually took a pencil, and I flipped open just a one page, and uh, on that one page that I flipped to was John Waters, the other acclaimed filmmaker from Baltimore, Maryland's uh, address and phone number and things. So I wrote down John Waters' information, and then I used to call John Waters uh, late at night back in the mid-90s, kind of, I'd get kind of drunk or whatever and call John Waters up and brag to people at parties that I knew John Waters and then I'd call him and only one time did John Waters answer and I kind of woke him up because I always forget about the time zone problem. But there's that story about, uh, about that and I just thought it was just so kind of fascinating to sort of walk around Gus's stuff and sort of, uh, you know, he had his guitars, he had a lot of guitars, and I, it was kind of, he always did music and stuff. I'm still trying to get Gus to put the Story All Blondes back together. It would be a huge, huge, huge show. So if you ever want to put that show together, Gus, you just call me up. I'll make that happen. So there's that story. And then also just, you know, people around Portland, you know, running into River Phoenix and Keanu Reeves and yada, 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 everybody going to parties and having stories. But I didn't really get to hang out with them too much. A little bit at the Mallory Hotel at the Driftwood Room. And then I know a lot of people up there at the Driftwood Room where people uh, would say that, like, River and his sisters and things were, were, like, hanging out and were very nice and, like, playing the guitar in the lobby after hours and stuff like that, which all seemed kind of cool. And, that, you know, Portland showed him a good welcome, for sure. So, there you go. That's cool. That's cool. Do you want me to tell you another quick one? I can tell you about Bob. Yeah, so let's yeah, Bob. I'll tell you one quick story about Bob. Um, so... Bob was uh, in the movie, and uh, he pretty much played himself, and he was brilliant in it. And uh, Bob was kind of a character around town, and I, I kind of came across him sort of later on, again, right around that town time, and I think was introduced by probably through Scott Green. And uh, he was pretty much a, like, he kind of knew everybody in Portland, and I don't really know exactly what his whole story was, but he was a, he was kind of like Jabba the Hutt, and he was really gay. And uh, 
and that, which was you know pretty interesting going over there because there was always these kind of characters kind of in and out of his bedroom and his living room and you weren't really sure what was going on and he would sort of sit in a robe with nothing on underneath and it was you know it's you know his robe would part and you would see his you know job of the head penis and things and and he, yeah, he talks you totally about it. He had that crazy Bob voice. I'm slaughtering. And, and uh, he had a real, he had kind of a liking to my uh, business partner, Benjamin. It made him very uncomfortable. And one time we were over at Bob's house and um, doing illicit substances. And uh, cops happened to be in town at the same time, that terrible, terrible show. Cops. And uh, we were all kind of sitting in Bob's bedroom. And uh, suddenly, like, out, he lived on misery and failing, misery and failing. He always liked saying, like, I live on the corner of misery and failing, which is always pretty amusing. And, uh, and suddenly, like, his entire backyard, like, opens this, like, boom, boom, it's all lit up. And we're like, Jesus Christ, we're getting busted. Everybody's scrambling around, freaking out. But it was just cops was in town, and they had, like, busted this poor soul and had chased him into Bob's backyard. And so there was all these TV cameras and cops, and they're busting this guy. And it was terrible. I hate that show. Never, ever watch cops. That was that story, too. Um, but you have to say who you are and what this place is so they know. Yeah. My name's Trace Shannon, and this is Voodoo Donut. And I'm a, a co-owner of Voodoo Donut, and uh, it's downtown, in, uh, still in Old Town, so Gus understands Old Town. You should come down and get a donut sometime. You. You're welcome. Bye.